Pro Evolution Soccer 5 has always been an all-time favourite of mine, but it's only now, nearing 20 years after its release, that I've found the words to do it justice. There are many reviews out there from 2005 that cover its gameplay, features and so on, but in this video I've attempted to capture what made it so perfectly balanced and special to many fans. I wasted a huge number of hours playing this game as a teenager, and wanted to see how it held up 18 years and 3 console generations later. To my surprise, I once again became addicted. There is some nostalgia involved here of course, both for the game and the 2005-06 football season, but there are so many things that should have driven me away. The graphics are rough around the edges, the game mechanics are unrefined, and the emulator stutters and occasionally refuses to let me run right until I reconnect my controller. So what kept me playing? I believe the answer says a lot about design, both in football games and video games in general. I'd always considered the period between PES 4 and PES 6 on the PlayStation 2 and Xbox to be a high tide mark for football games, but even with this in mind, when playing more modern games, I could never really pinpoint why. Returning to PES 5 in 2023 with fresh eyes had given me the perspective I needed to put this X Factor into words. The reasons for PES 5's superiority lie both on and off the pitch, but I believe the latter's a masterstroke that's key to the game's overall addictiveness. The Master League is Konami's answer to FIFA's career mode, a multi-season campaign that puts the player in charge of a club, with financial responsibilities and the freedom to make transfers. But the Master League leans away from realism and integrates systems more often seen in other video game genres. An important difference is that the Master League's focus is on the club, not the manager's career. The player can either select or create a team at the beginning of the Master League, and cannot switch to another team at any point. If they choose the latter option, they choose the team's name, design kits, and select other attributes like a stadium and crowd colours. The real way to play the Master League is to begin with the default squad, rather than the team's real-life players. This team, which includes fictional players like Castolo, Menander, and Ivorov, is largely useless in terms of ability. They take touches meters ahead of themselves, hit shots wildly off target unless facing the goal at walking pace, and are outmuscled even by the smallest opponents. This means there's a natural siege mentality for the first couple of seasons, and scraping even a point feels like a victory. Unlike FIFA, where selecting Man City will mean Champions League matches in your first year in charge, it's not even possible to reach continental competition in the Master League until at least the third season, and even that's unlikely given the players initially at your disposal. This adds to the sense of progression as the player, and by extension their club, earn their place in the footballing world. All of this means the player has a far greater sense of ownership than they do in other games' career modes, where they can take over a successful team of competent players assembled by a real-world manager. This is your club, and as the seasons progress and you slowly bring in talent during the transfer windows, each player in the squad reflects a decision you have made. It's less realistic, but it makes for a far more engaging game. This culminates in a mode structured more like a football RPG than a sports game. The squad is akin to the player's party, the matches are battles, and the time between is spent managing resources and organising the party in a way that increases the success rate, including keeping track of players' development and signing new personnel where required. To help them on their way, PES tracks and makes available quite a bit more data than even the most recent football games. An important aspect of this is that transfers are straightforward and are far more about affordability than negotiation, which is rarely done well in games. In this respect, the player's focus is always on their points balance and earning enough to upgrade. They aren't forced to sit through lengthy office cutscenes or play guessing games with an inconsistent AI to agree on a price. Scouting players to sign is more rewarding than in modern FIFA or PES. Players in both current games have an overall rating, which often reduces comparison to a single statistic and makes choosing between two players a one-dimensional affair. PES 5 does not have this statistic, and the player must instead scan each player's full attributes to gain an impression of their ability. Overlapping star diagrams allow the player to directly compare six attributes when switching players, sometimes forcing an informed decision. For example, do I choose a fullback who is pacey and attacking, or powerful and defensive? The exaggerated speed and visibility with which these attributes improve also adds to the RPG-like sense of narrative and progression. After each match, the player is taken to a screen where progression points for each attribute stack up for the players that took to the pitch, and it's hugely satisfying to see your signings attributes increase. 
However, the most important part of Master League, and something that I think has been lost in every current career mode, is the fact that it keeps the player extremely focused on a simple task, survival and development. There's no fan sentiment to monitor, no board waiting to sack you, and no possibility of a move to another club. It's you and your created team against the world, and if they fail, you may be forced to start another game. The risk is comparable to that of classic arcade games. Points are the currency in PES 5, and the only number that matters is your bank account balance. You earn points by getting results, a thousand for a win, 500 for a draw, and bonus points for each goal scored. Your players are paid an annual salary, and if you don't have enough points to cover the wage bill at the end of the season, it's game over. Leftover funds can be used to sign new players, leading to something of a gamble on the mental risk-reward calculation when signing players during the mid-season transfer window. Will the added talent be enough to secure the results necessary to pay the wages at the end of the season, or will your ambition be the cause of your downfall? The focus on points and the wage bill adds real tension to the Master League. It raises the stakes of each individual match, especially towards the end of a subpar season, and while the board won't be on your back for being knocked out of the cup, it will reduce the number of matches and therefore your chance of winning points. This can lead to an intense scramble to scrape results in the last few fixtures. The point system also has the effect of tying Master League difficulty directly to match difficulty. A greater challenge on the pitch means a lower chance of amassing points and signing star players. As a result, the focus is always on the football, which makes sense because no PES or FIFA game will ever be football manager. Perhaps the Master League economy is a byproduct of development limitations, but accidental or not, it's a beautifully concise system that could be discussed alongside some of history's best gameplay loops. But what of the gameplay on the pitch, where the player spends most of their time? I remember marvelling at the realism of PES 5 back in 2005, but in retrospect it's nothing of the sort. Quick passes fly about effortlessly, players' movements follow robotic paths, and pinball-like deflections between bodies produce some truly comedic spells of play. These issues may have been due to the hardware of the time, but these compromises make the game more fun. No football game before PES 5, and arguably no game since, flows as fantastically as Konami's masterpiece. Its gameplay mechanics are designed for fast end-to-end -end action, with passes pinging between players with pinpoint accuracy, but ball control is heavy enough that any attempt to break into a packed penalty area carries a real risk of losing possession. This means shooting from distance is just as viable an option, and it's possible to score some real 30-yard screamers with the more talented players of the time like Frank Lampard and Steven Gerrard. The game's attacking balance is unmatched. You're just as likely to score or miss with a long shot, a run through the middle, or a cross into the box. All of those different shot types, deflections, mistakes, and rebounds add an organic unpredictability that means that even after hundreds of hours of play, new situations still emerge. This stops attacking and defending, even against the AI, from falling into the predictable patterns seen in many football games. PES 5's AI is also a bigger challenge than any modern football game's equivalent. Three seasons into my new campaign, Pain, I was just about winning consistently on 4 stars, and that still left me with the 5 star mode and the 6 star mode unlockable via the PES shop to take on. PES 5 matches also benefit from being left to run their course naturally. In 2023, football game forums are rife with complaints about alleged momentum mechanics, the idea that the game wants a certain result for entertainment value and makes a losing team more likely to score a last minute equaliser, or a team of minnows more likely to beat a giant. While I remember reading some initial murmurings about momentum at the time, PES 5 largely seems to let the game flow, free from artificial drama. The bulk of the momentum that you'll find here is in the commentary, particularly from Trevor Brooking, who seems obsessed with the word, especially following goals. Those RPG elements are also present as you take to the pitch, with the game adjusting noticeably to players' attributes and engineering situations for them to take effect. Starting a player with less fatigue and better form is often more beneficial than starting a jaded superstar, and some abilities like the famous lofted through ball are essentially locked off until you have skilled enough players. These limitations initially led me to believe that the game was much more basic than I remembered when I first picked it up, but as I acquired more talented players and began to see the effects on the pitch, I realized that this was just another facet of its complexity. In a similar way, a game of PES 5 involves several subtle and sometimes slightly frustrating gameplay features that digress from real football in the name of playability. low skill players take huge touches when controlling even the simplest pass, for example, and players always stumble when tackled, making it impossible to instantly win the ball back. 
even the visually jarring way in which the ball will occasionally pass through a player's leg is really Konami rolling the d20 once more, with the attacker's ability and luck totaling more than the defender's or vice versa. We saw a variety of set-piece systems employed in the 2000s, but in my opinion PES 5 strikes the perfect balance between any, again bringing player attributes to the forefront. Rather than a complicated system of giant arrows, ball contact diagrams and stop the slider mini-games, Konami gave us free means of influencing free kicks, the initial angle, a power bar and the application of curl with the d-pad. The result is that free kicks are fast, direct and satisfying when they hit the top corner and when the player fails they always feel like they could do better with a tweak to their technique. Penalties are even more straightforward. Both the player and the goalkeeper select one of nine directions. That's it. No power bar, no stuttering run-ups or star jumps on the line, and no fancy chips down the centre. What happens next is the combination of luck and player attributes. Even if the goalkeeper dives the right way, they might not keep the shot out if their skills don't match the strikers, and the taker always stands a chance of hitting the post or missing entirely. All of this isn't to say that PES 5's interpretation of football is perfect. Referees in particular could have used some refinement. Despite being very strict on minor infringements, they seem to have no sense of whether a foul was committed by the last man. A deliberate but minor foul on a player through on goal will usually yield no card. The AI does it to me, I do it to the AI, and essentially it just becomes another fair gameplay tactic. The advantage rule is also massively inconsistent and is something that modern football games definitely do better. The main issue here is that the period that the referee plays advantage for tends to be very short. If an opposing player fouls my attacker and the ball happens to fall to his strike partner, the advantage icon disappears almost as soon as he controls it, meaning no free kick is awarded even if he's being tightly marked and is immediately dispossessed. Finally, despite the flowing gameplay and organic deflections, the players themselves aren't always the quickest to react to unexpected passages of play. Generally this isn't an issue, but it can be frustrating to see a deflected clearance apparently fall into your star forward's path, only for him to refuse to approach the ball, letting a more distant defender get there first and clean up the mess. So what does this analysis of an 18-year-old football game tell us about video games more broadly? I think the key message is that a compromise between realism and gameplay, which used to be forced upon developers by limited hardware, is essential to creating a more playable game. The conversation around sports games always focuses on which more closely resembles the real game, but perhaps the focus would be better placed on which is more fun instead. The same is true of games in other genres. Another Konami series, Metal Gear Solid, evolved in a similar way. Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3 were arguably the series' peak, when gameplay was constrained to small areas that presented controlled, isolated challenges and a large amount of effort was spent adding colour, story and character. Fast forward to Metal Gear Solid 5 and emphasis is squarely on open world gameplay, with few cutscenes and little memorable dialogue. A niche more commonly explored by mid-level and indie developers is the game that has fairly simple mechanics and modern graphics. This section of the gaming market is wide-ranging, but I would point to examples like Football Manager, the rebooted Hitman series, and modern Wolfenstein and Doom games. These games follow almost the same core gameplay formula that similar titles did 15 years ago, but the developers have used the extra power at their disposal to make them prettier, refine mechanics and improve their AI, rather than adding unnecessary complexity or targeting hyper-realism at the expense of player enjoyment. In the football genre in particular, I suspect there are many disenfranchised players out there who would jump at the chance to play a game similar to the classic PES titles, with minor improvements rather than additional features that increase realism but make the game more of a chore to play. PES improved somewhat during the PS4 and Xbox One generation, but definitely wasn't as fast or addictive as it was previously, and the Master League was diluted massively in pursuit of FIFA's career mode, and that's without even touching upon the mess that is eFootball. With the focus on cash generating online services like FIFA Ultimate Team and eFootball's Dream Team, gameplay has remained relatively consistent for a while now, but perhaps there's a small developer out there who could take a chance on a simpler, more arcadey title that resembles a refined classic PEZ. Thank you for watching, and if you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel and visiting stratpack.blog for more.